So Kevin, thank you very much for joining me on this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm so glad to be talking to you, man. Uh, I've been consuming your content for such a long time. It's just surreal to be talking to you here. Thank you for accepting this invite and putting this time to to chat with me in this new series where I'm trying to kind of um, bring in people who have influenced my journey into tech or in general are helping the community grow in one shape or another. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's always for me fun talking to people that you know know my stuff, but also you know I'm glad that you've appreciated it and, and learned some stuff from it. So that always makes me happy to to hear about too. <laughs> Absolutely. The, um, I think um, it's safe to say that I I think I learned HTML, semantic HTML, and the proper way of doing HTML um, from you and CSS, obviously as people call you the king of CSS <laughs> on YouTube. I've, I've heard Kyle mention that, and I really believe that in CSS, um, I think your approach brings actually more to the table than CSS. You, you have so much care for um, things like accessibility or semantic HTML for writing stuff that actually means to um, uh, means something other than just putting divs um, and wrapping them uh, with the styles and, you know, accomplishing the design, you have you actually go further than that. I have taken courses from you, I think, in, on Scrimba or on Podium. I don't even remember the, the platforms, but I, uh, I, I love your approach in that um, you bring in so much joy to the learning process. Um, it may it may be simple what it is that you're trying to do, but you bring in so much joy and you can approach it from different perspectives and it always makes it fun. I, I can still remember the the course that I had with you on Scrimba and where I built maybe my first portfolio site. Um, it was it was very fun. And one thing that I appreciate from you now that I am also creating content is how how uh, how real you are. You're very you're very similar to the way that I'm talking to you right now in your videos, and that's very hard to do. So um, I know I just dived into it, but why don't you give us a, a little background of you, how you got into web development to CSS and then to YouTube and and all that. Yeah, so it was a bit of a strange path for me to get to here, uh, just in that web development was sort of this weird hobby I had going back to the late 90s in high school, where I would just muck around with it to like, oh, you know, I, I like playing with Photoshop too. And back then, web development was basically you'd make something in Photoshop and slice it to get all the different pieces you need and then put it together. And it wasn't the greatest, but at the time, it was fun for me because I didn't know, well, none of us knew any better. That's just how we did it. Um, and like, I never saw that being something I would get into and it was, I'd sort of play around with it a little bit I'd stop for months or even a year or something. And then, oh, I need another website. So I sort of, you have to relearn a little bit, get back into it. And it was on and off for a long time, uh, until I started, um, I ended up going to school for design and that there was some like very basic web classes there. So that sort of re invigorated me a little bit. CSS3 was a thing then. So it was like, oh, we're not doing these table layouts anymore. We don't have to slice stuff anymore. It was really exciting and fun. Um, and I ended up getting a job as a designer, but it wasn't the best job um, in terms of pay. It was a good job, but uh, in terms of experience, but the pay was really bad. So I was freelancing on the side. Most of the freelance work I was doing for designs was UI design stuff for websites. And I was like, well, if they're going to pay me to design it. Maybe they'll also pay me more to turn it into an actual website once they approve the design. Yeah. Um, and so then I started getting into, you know, making websites um, happen. And I was doing it mostly through creating child themes in WordPress. And a lot of what I was doing once I made a few things that were much more custom and I was like, this is a waste of time. <laughs> um, so I just started basically always starting with the same theme, deleting the CSS file and just starting from scratch on the CSS side, because I realized like it, I could make completely different looking websites just by, you know, the same general structure. You might need a few little customizations here or there, but like same general thing going on, on sort of the, the structure of everything, but then just coming with the CSS and doing a completely different look. And it was sort of like CSS Zen garden back in the day where it was just recreating over and over again. And I think looking back at it, I realized that's sort of when I fell in love with the whole CSS side of things. And I realized that I like that side better than being a designer. Um, then I ended up going to school. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, well, I did go to school to be a teacher. Um, so I started teaching in the classroom. 
And then when I was teaching, I ended up doing a lot of introduction to web development stuff since they found out I had web experience. Um, so I was teaching in the classroom that I got a little bit bored with the material and that led me to starting my YouTube channel just so I could talk about a little bit more interesting things than repeating the same curriculum over and over again. Oh uh, yeah. Um, it's interesting you say, uh, that your gateway into falling in love with CSS and design or making websites is the themes in WordPress. Cause that's actually the way that I want to cause kind of was vowed in the beginning to, you would get like a site, same structure, same material, same data, but a different theme just makes it look a completely different site. And I was like, how is this even possible? It's just the same content, the same blog post, but it completely um, changes the way that it looks. Um, I remember in your videos, you mentioned that you were teaching this stuff in the school environment first, because that's how it was back in the days before YouTube was a thing or people, you know, started uploading tutorials or it became popular kind of on YouTube. How long have you been been doing the YouTube channel? YouTube, I think it's seven years now on YouTube. Wow. I, I admire that. <laughs> <laughs> it's because um, it's hard. Now, when I started learning, I, I've always had this approach of documenting what I was learning throughout my journey. And then uh, at one, one point I started just putting what, whatever that I was learning in, in blog posts and people started like uh, reading it and it got some traction. I was like, okay, maybe I just put out a video, but then I didn't realize how harder it is to make the video because blog posts, you're just writing, you're just re-editing and it's just so much easier to just uh, kind of summarize your thoughts even that is hard, but it's easier than video now doing it for seven years and creating quality content is just so hard. So, um, kudos <laughs> to, <laughs> I, it's funny you say that. And I know most people, I know say the same as you, I actually find videos easier than written content. Bro, um, no way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it is for me, when I do written content, I end up like re-editing over, like it has to be perfect basically. And I keep going over it and it just like the small little grammar things. And then I can make this change and I can just, I can do it forever. Whereas with video first, I don't mind the more like natural, just, you know, I can be me on if I make a mistake or if I, um, or ah, like I can edit some of that out, but whatever it is, you can have that natural cadence and a little bit more of a natural flow. I feel so I don't feel like I need to edit it to like be absolutely perfect. And I think the other side is because I was teaching in the classroom before I got really used to just doing live demos and showing things and going through the code and talking while I was doing it. Um, so for me, I think that really helped on that side of things where it's just like the way I prepare my stuff is like, I don't need something really in depth unless it's a topic that I'm really starting to learn myself. But a lot of the time it's like, I can just throw a quick demo up, you know, throw a quick demo together beforehand. Okay. I know all the stuff I need to cover, dive into it and, and just go. So for me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting you say that, but I think um I I understand for what reason you're saying it. Well, first of all, I think the experience that you had in person definitely has a part because you're just used to delivering your content verbally and, mm -hmm. and presenting it and demoing it. Um but I also get the part that when you're writing something, it's just uh the amount of revisions you can do is just unlimited. Uh, for me, that's kind of the same way on the video too. Sometimes I just find myself repeating the same thing over and over again. Uh, and I strive the, for uh, being as real as possible, just like what I mentioned about you, because in your videos, what I noticed is... Um, it's just as if I'm talking to you in person, you're just explaining something. If you make mistakes, you go back, you're like, oh, no, this is not the way that it should be done. Or, you know, even the, the way that you talk uh, and you've gotten used to uh, just being okay <laughs> to be yourself and, you know, make mistakes. It's, it's, it requires a bit of vulnerability to just put yourself raw out there. I ended up, um, I end up usually editing uh, my content or sometimes doing retakes. 
um, which is the part it, that's kind of frustrating because it takes away from the actual message. Sometimes you repeated it and it just doesn't sound like you. <laughs> I, I I don't know if this goes away or not, but I've heard from so many YouTubers that the, the main struggle that you have in the beginning is that you sound nothing like yourself. You turn, as soon as I turn this camera, I just sound like a news reporter. I'm like, this is not, why, why am I sounding like this? So um, did you have this uh, in at any point and it kind of got more comfortable for you or no? It's just has been like this from the get-go yeah I, I definitely early on there was more editing involved um even now the hardest parts for me are like the introduction when i'm just talking directly to the camera i don't like because there i'll have i know what i want to say i have a little script to go through um on those ones it ends up being like a lot of takes and you're just like <laughs> keep flubbing it and messing it up i find once i get into the code and it's always been that way once i get into like demo mode and i'm just yes. giving the lesson i find that's the easy part yeah. Um, just cause there it flows a bit more. If I, I definitely know what you mean about making a mistake and then redoing it. Cause you become more sort of formal about it. Cause now you know exactly what you're going to be doing. Uh, so I, I've definitely been there, um, whether it's been mistakes or forgetting to record my audio or, yeah. um, you know, sometimes I will even watch back. I'm editing a video and I'm like, you know what? I'm sort of it's a little bit too raw because <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like you're just like, get to the point now. Like I'm either I do one thing I do tend to do is ramble a little bit because I like to explain, I don't want to show people how to do it. I want them to understand why it's working. Um, and it's one of the complaints that I do I've, I've had since I started my channel was that my videos are a little bit long. Um, and I'm just like, Oh, it's seven years. I'm doing this now. So it's not going to change. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I think people know what they get when they watch my stuff now, where it, it might go a little bit longer than than other ones. I know like Kyle has sort of the opposite approach um, where he, for, you know, he sort of focuses in on trying to be succinct and like, let's get this done and, and to the point. Um, yeah. Whereas for me, it's I don't I, just, I ramble a little bit and sort of go into the weeds. But it's the part for me, I have to do it that way because that's what interests me. I want to know why it works, how it works. I might even tangent and like, oh, that makes me realize of this. Let's talk about that now. And I try and keep it focused, uh, obviously. But sometimes, you know, if I think it's something that's useful to talk about, it, you know, as long as it's within context of what I'm teaching, then I don't mind having little sidetracks or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that's exactly what I appreciate about your content, and that's you know kind of diving deeper from the surface level of okay, just slap the CSS classes or styles, and and it would get the job done. Rather, you talk about okay, why is it like this? Why is it working? And you mentioned this about like people getting frustrated with CSS and you know trying to make it work, but it doesn't, and it's all because they don't understand how it's working. When you do understand how it's working, then it it's less frustrating because you're like, oh, okay, this is this is why this is happening and this is how I can solve it. And your approach is exactly that because finding a solution to a problem by just searching it, maybe if five seconds, you won't require to un to watch a video for that. But once, once somebody wants to watch the video, it's because they want to learn, okay, why is this acting in this weird kind of um, behavior for CSS? And I think... Uh, just from the success that you have had on your channel, uh, it shows that people appreciate that approach. So maybe sometimes uh, people and even me and you get impatient to wanting to get some answer and that happens to everyone, but I, I think I do appreciate. And your channel is mainly about CSS to be kind of niche on CSS. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about any of these like little new cool frameworks and what's happening it's just css it's very fundamental and still having this success shows that the depth of knowledge that you bring to the table actually is appreciated from your community um, so we talked about how you got into css i remember back in the days i uh, watched a video uh, from you on Either it was Webflow or one of these platforms that help you just build UIs. And I remember back in the days, people are freaking out that this, uh, we don't need CSS anymore. You don't need this. You could just use these tools and stuff. And it was interesting for me to see you're actually creating content on that because you're just teaching CSS. It's the opposite. Like you are having a video on a tool that's kind of targeting you as, um, it was very interesting to see that you're very open to it and you're like, hey, 
this is if 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 you're using these tools you you need to know css to make the best out of this and if this helps you accomplish whatever it is that you're doing go for it but uh this may not this this is not all um so take us back to uh the introduction of these type of tools and how it has affected css or web development or your journey and then we're going to kind of take it further to go to this the new era of ai tools and you know these ui libraries yeah, uh, yeah, it's a, a really good question. I think that um, there, there's been this like striving of these no code solutions for a really long time. Uh, at one point, I think Dreamweaver even was attempting to um, way back when, and it's always been this thing where like this next thing would come out, and then you'd be like, "Oh, is this going to be the one that's going to like we don't need to do that you know development anymore because it's all that we have this visual way of doing it and I think it would get developers backs go up a little bit, but I'm just, it's never, they've gotten better, but I really still feel like they fill in a specific niche um, within web development. Uh, I know that the, the big one now is also Framer where you're sort of, you know, getting all the people that are proficient in Figma are much more comfortable using something like that. Uh, and it's not going to take away jobs. I think it does the opposite in that it opens up and that, that's why I've always appreciated tools that make things easier or more accessible is like you're opening the doors to more people that does potentially mean more competition. But, you know, if I go back to my very early days, it was at one point, like a lot of people didn't have websites just because you couldn't afford to hire a developer <laughs> that would be or a team or an agency or whatever it was. Or if you did have a website, it was just this really, you know, basically an image that you put on a URL and there was nothing there. It was just a little, you know, it would have the company's address and a picture and that was about it. And so I think a lot of these things that make these things more accessible to everybody is it just means that all of these smaller companies and these other people can now afford to have websites. And I'm sure they did cannibalize, like, you know, there, there's always going to be this like crossover between when that one of those tools works and when somebody had an existing website with their full-time developers or team or whatever it was that now maybe they can make that crossover so there, there will be some disruption i think when you have a really good tool that can do the job like that um but i think it just opens more doors to more potential clients and more potential stuff that's out there rather than being something that's gonna be like oh this is going to take away from what i'm doing I agree. Um, uh, it, it it does definitely um, creates. Uh, it does definitely create competition and bring in more people or make it more accessible for people to use these sites. For example, a, a come up with some of these kind of tools are um, kind of easy enough for clients to use it themselves, whereas they won't need anyone any developer specifically. But it's uh, also something that can help developers. So if you're using, let's say, Framer, the animations and transitions that you can just accomplish by Framer is so easy. It would be way harder to just up use the Framer motion library to apply the same animation and animations and transitions. So you can, as a developer, you can just uh, benefit from that because not every client would be savvy enough to go into the little nitty gritty and of applying animations in Framer. So it can be something that can help you too. Uh, but it does also uh, creates that opportunity for those type of clients or companies that want to have it in-house and they don't want to have a developer. Specifically, Framer, I know that it has a CMS too, so it just takes care of it end-to-end. -end. Mm -hmm. They can just publish content and they can just redesign and they don't have to talk to another agency or a developer, which has been sometimes pain points for people finding a developer that doesn't know what they're doing on, I don't know, these uh, platforms uh, that are out there and then ending up spending money and not in, not getting what they want and then just switching to something that they, their their assistant can can just take care of it rather than a developer. Now, talking, talking about these type of tools, uh, it seems like AI has changed a lot in the past year not only in the amount of functionality that it brings to the world of web development as tools or as features that we can add or use as developers, uh, but some interesting stuff happening around uh, UI, UI libraries, like for example, the V0 SDK from Vercel, where you just give it a prompt and it at least gives you the starting point of something that you want to build. Uh, 
Uh, I want to get your take on it. And also recently that uh, Devon AI, which is even further from a front end kind of developer, they, they claim to replace software engineers by doing back end stuff. So I, I would love to get your take on that too. Being in the industry for, uh, you know, t- 10 years or more, more yeah. than having, having creating content for seven years. I definitely have some strong opinions on Devin, so I'll get to that in a second. Um, when it comes to just AI in general, um, I think the one thing like, ever since it started, it's been this like perpetual cycle of like, oh no, you know, we've lost our jobs, and then nothing really changed that much, <laughs> and then <laughs> a new a new one would come out, and then it would be a little bit more of the same. You'd see the new demos or the new stuff it could do, and then the same cycle would sort of repeat. Um, and I think there's a lot of marketing that's going behind it, um, which doesn't help because it's sort of, you know, you're pushing things to try and make your product look really good. And then everybody gets up in arms. Uh, I think the state of the tools right now is they're very, you know, it, they're super helpful. <laughs> um, they, they can help save us time um, and, and help just with productivity. Um, I do think the term AI is a little bit broad because they're not you know, it's not really what I think most people would consider or say 10 years from now, we could probably look back at them and be like, that wasn't really much um, in terms of what I would expect from an AI. There's sort of these helpful tools that you can prompt and get stuff from. Um, In terms of taking, you know, again, taking away jobs and other stuff like that, I'm not concerned for the short term at all. Um, The one, I guess the one issue or the one impact they can have is if, all of a sudden, you know, we are getting something that makes us much more productive. Do you need as many people on your team? That's probably the one place where it could impact the number of jobs out there. I don't think, I know some people have actually attributed the whole tech sort of landscape right now where all, you know, all the layoffs that are going on and all these issues. And it just, I think it's a coincidence that it's happening at the same time as all this AI stuff, because tech has gone through this cycle before um, and it's going to go through it again. Uh, we're going to at one point bottom out and then it'll sort of turn around and start going back up. And if you look at outside of tech and you zoom out, it's not just tech that this is happening to right now. It's the economy in general. And so we're just sort of a microcosm of what's happening. So I don't think there's any relation to it there. Um, and when it comes to sort of the, the these new tools that are coming out, we have Devin, like you said, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Devin's just a really good marketing Um that whole thing they do with the visuals where to me, that's just like, how can we make our AI product look more impressive? Well, let's show it the work that it's doing. Right. So like you see it pull open a browser and then you see it open the terminal and it's like, you, that's just flash. Like you don't need the AI doesn't need to pull up the browser to search the web. Like it's uh, so I think it's really smart marketing, but I'm like, yeah, this, I think it's a two month old, or even if it's like a two year old startup, but I think it's months old startup to, I'm not concerned about a new model that they've come up with um, compared to the, you know, these other companies that have been putting a lot more money into everything. And even then, like, uh, I do take it with a bit of grain of salt because I do see it as a lot of marketing, but the numbers they put out to show how good it is compared to the other models, to me also highlight how bad it actually is. Uh, Cause they put out that, the, um, you know, that I don't remember what it's called, but there's that, um, thing you can feed it the open source problems and see how effectively it can solve them on its own. And I think the previous best yeah. model was at like 5% and this one did 13%. And that's a huge jump if it's true, because it hasn't been verified by that site the last time I looked. But even if they have made that, that's a huge improvement. But to then say this is a self-sufficient software engineer that can solve 13% of you know, pull requests that you're giving it, uh, that person's not going to keep a job for too long. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. If, if you're an employee and you can only solve 13% of the things that you're coming across, you're, you're in a little bit of trouble. Um, now again, that's, it's still a huge improvement and we're going to keep seeing those improvements, uh, over time. Um, but I just think personally, Devin, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't hear about it like six months from now, a year from now, I wouldn't be surprised if it was just this thing that made a splash and then faded off. And there'll be other ones that come up um, over time too. And I do think at one point we'll sort of hit a threshold, but I also related a little bit to 
um, other things like right if, if it were at 13% solve rate or whatever it is now. And again, that could be more beneficial if you're not using it to solve the problems, but you're using it to help you solve problems, then obviously like that becomes more useful. So you have to put it into some context. My issue with Devin is that they're marketing it as a AI software engineer, which to me means you can work independently, which I don't think it can. Um, but it's the same as anything else. You have the self-driving cars right now that we've, you know, I think a lot when self-driving cars started, it looked like we wouldn't have any regular cars on the road um, <laughs> within five years. And then they realized, and you have all these impressive demos and closed environments where the cars we could drive around. And now they're actually, you know, there are actual self-driving cars out there, but they're very limited in what they can do just because getting to that like 98%, even from 90 to 95% is really hard. And then from 95 to 98 is 10 times harder. And then 98% to that last 100% is, you know, it just, this it's exponentially more difficult the closer you get to it being better. Obviously, a self-driving car has to, if you're going to just let them be fully self-sufficient, they need to be much better than an AI that just builds programs or whatever, because if it makes a mistake, it's not going to run anybody over. Um, but I think it's the same thing. We're, like, we're still at the low-hanging fruit stage, where it's going from 5% to 13%. Then it's like we're below 50% still. Until you get to that, it's the low-hanging fruit. It's going to keep going faster and faster. And at one point, we're going to start getting diminishing returns. Um, so... Yeah, it's a really long way. Sorry, I was rambling a lot there. <laughs> nah, no worries. Uh, it's a long way for me to say I'm not too concerned, uh, especially in like five to 10 years. I don't think we'll see a gigantic shift. I think we'll see changes for sure. And I think once it's good enough to actually start disrupting our industry, it's also going to be good enough to be disrupting every industry that's out there. So it's not like, oh, no, I can't be a software engineer. It's like, well, I, you know, the world's going to, have to fundamentally change at one point. Yeah, I I totally agree with with the points that you mentioned there. First of all, um, I see it as something that can help reduce maybe the amount of people that we need on a team because now as a software engineer, I can be so much more efficient using these tools. Even things like uh, Copilot, GitHub Copilot, can help uh, fasten the process uh, of developing something. Or, you know, it 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 um, it's kind of like peer programming where you just get suggestions and you iterate over it. So it would definitely transform the way that we are doing our jobs, at least in the near future, um, it, where none of these tools can be trusted on their own to kind of create these codes and deploy softwares that our companies depend on. Uh, but definitely it can change the way that we are doing our job. I think that's the case with every uh, breakthrough in technology. It creates some jobs, it transforms some jobs, mm -hmm. and some jobs would be unnecessary. And that's okay because there's going to be more jobs created because of these technologies. Now you need to be able to use these tools or you need to be able to be the person creating these tools. So it just changes the way that it is. Software engineering isn't going anywhere because software engineers are the ones creating these tools. So um, I think it would definitely change. And I think you mentioned correctly there that this um, layoffs that are happening in tech is, um, first of all, happening in other segments too. But also, I think it was because of the overhiring that happened in the pandemic. It's everything turned like remote and companies started just hiring more people. And now they're just shedding off some of those overhirings for those years. And we're just going back to normal how it was before the pandemic. And that may have also an effect because none of these AI tools are at a point that can totally replace a team of 20 people. So it may make the teams or developers more efficient, as you mentioned, but um, maybe in future, uh, it would be a more dramatic change. And all of these uh, companies that are still, um, they're still very new. All of these technologies are still very new. The models are still very new and they're going to improve over time. So it's not something to ignore, but it's something that I think we have to position ourselves in a way to benefit from uh, instead of just treating it as a threat and uh, defending our position by denying them or ignoring them, but thinking of ways that we can actually incorporate learning them. Maybe we need to change gear. Maybe we need to shift um, 
where we're working in the software kind of industry. Yeah, I agree. And what, one, one last thing that I thought of, because it's funny when I've talked to some people about it and they've said over the last couple of years, their opinions have shifted in how it's going to work. Cause a lot of people who don't focus as much on the front end thought that was the low hanging fruit that would be the first stuff to go and have the AIs be able to do. And now they're like, everything I'm trying to do with it, it can't do that side very well. And I'm like, yeah, that makes the most, to me, that was one thing that I was thinking from early on because the front end is so context dependent. Like you don't have isolation in HTML and CSS. Everything is, you know, if I change the layout of one element, it's impacting other stuff around it. And so like how, for the AI tools to be able to understand the context, you know, if you center a div, well, there's seven different ways to do it, which is the best one to do it. It depends on the context of what you're doing on a little bit of a bigger picture and everything. And I find getting, that's what I'm seeing with the current state of them anyway, is like the context that they can't, it's hard for them to be able to get the correct context of how the other parts are affecting the page and the layout and everything else. Um, so yeah, I was just like, just to add on there, I, I think the more sort of isolated things can be when it comes to functions and other stuff, you could ask, you know, and I use it for JavaScript. Sometimes you prompt it for something that could be like, I need a simple function. This is what it needs to do. Well, that's that function. It's this one thing that does that one thing and it's perfect. Or you give it some code and it can correct your code or find your missing semicolon or whatever it is, which is super handy. Um, but I think as software engineers in general, so much of what we're doing is problem solving, not these little problems, but we're solving, we're using those little solutions to solve these bigger problems. And I think that idea of the AI finding that context in things, I think is extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons I think that it's a really good productivity tool and not something that's going to take over anytime soon. I think that that's such a good point there that I've never thought about it this way. Um, well, one thing you, you said is, is the context that the AI needs to be aware as, as a human, you're aware of this, you know, A, A to B or A to Z context of things happening for this thing to work. But your example of front end versus back end, JavaScript versus CSS is actually also interesting <laughs> because the front end is, I think in the back end, AI has been more successful. You yeah. can just turn a prompt into a SQL queries and it's just doing it. Perplexity is just built on top of this, this thing. Um, but the front end stuff or the UI stuff isn't as good enough because as exactly because of what you mentioned, it's just, there's a thousand different things to do one thing and it just depends on everything else that's on the page already. So if you're just sending AI to just fix one thing here, it, it needs to understand everything else around it. Whereas if I want to just use the AI to build an API, to query my database, to write some functions, to write my controls or database access objects, it's just very standard. There's, there's no other way to do it. It's, I think it, the accomplishment rate there is more and the UI, and I never kind of uh, differentiated this line between the two. And I think uh, even from the tools out there, I can see um, that uh, on the UI part, we're still, maybe the tools give you a foundation of where to start. It's never completed. It's just, there's always buggy, but in the backend JavaScript or whatever you ask it, it's 99.99% there, if not a hundred percent. So that's absolutely right. Now we talked about AI, it kind of was a tangent there, but I want to go back to CSS. I know um, it has been a little while um, from uh, when I was just following uh, CSS and learning it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I uh, want to go back there and, and, and get your take on the new things uh, that was introduced in CSS and What's, what do you find interesting? The last thing that I came across, maybe this is a little older, but this is as far as I know, was container queries that I found very interesting. So I want to I wanna get your take on the new stuff that we're introduced to CSS. What is worth paying attention? What is worth learning? What is changing the way that we were doing stuff? Yeah, I think I mean, container queries is a great starting point uh, to talk a little bit about, just because I do think they're going to, have a very big impact on how we write code. Um, there was an interesting thing. It was um, Yuna Kravitz, who's on the um, Chrome team, 
put out a tweet asking people about why they're not using them yet. And the most, the I think it was like 50% or 40% of people said they don't even know what they are. But I was like, this is someone, these are people who are following Yuna, who's like a front end UI CSS person who talks about modern CSS all the time. And I was like shocked that that audience was still not knowing what they were because I, I was like, oh my goodness. Okay. There's a lot of education that needs to go on now. Um, I did a recent video on media queries and when I was putting the script together, because I had one that was really old and I'm like, I, I want a new one that can cover a little bit more. And I'm like, you know what? If somebody new is starting now and they're just learning about what a media query is, they should probably learn what a container query is too. So my video is now, it's probably a few months old now, but it was, you know, media queries and container queries. So comparing the two, when you'd want to use one, when you'd want to use the other. Um, and for people who don't know, uh, it's just, it's the same as a media query, but instead of looking at the viewport, it looks at the closest defined container. So you could have like the parent is a container. So then the element you know, you can have your three columns turning into stacked layout, depending on the context of where it is on the page, rather than it, how big is your viewport. Um, and I think they're hitting the right level of browser support now that we're actually going to start seeing them used. Um, Cause that's always the thing is like, here's this cool new thing. Now we have to wait two years for browser support to probably hit a good level so we can actually start using them. Uh, the other one there is layers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with layers. So we have the regular cascade layers. The ones we usually see are the user agent styles and then our own. And those are basically the only two. There is user styles. So like actually Arc browser has user styles, right? Because the user can put their own CSS on the page too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a little bit different how they do it though. Um, but there's this sort of thing where there's technically three layers to CSS. And now we have our own layers that we can define. So I can say like, I have a reset layer and a utilities layer and a components layer and a layout layer. And what it does is each, the specificity is unique to a layer. It's hard to explain without a demo, but let's say I had a reset layer and in my reset layer, I put in like an ID for some reason. I chose ID something and I overwrote a link styling or on my navigation, I don't know, something with an ID. Mm -hmm. If I have another layer after that, with an element selector, it can overwrite the ID from the pre the preceding layer because mm -hmm. it's in a higher, that layer has higher importance than the previous one. Mm -hmm. So each layer specificity is unique to sort of its own environment. Mm -hmm. And then each layer goes from there. Um, so that's just hitting about 95% browser support now. So I think it's going to be, it was one of those things like, this is cool, but I need to see how people are going to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those things too, where if it doesn't work, it breaks your site. Like you need, you need the person's browser to support that, mm -hmm. uh, or the CSS just doesn't work. So we definitely had to wait. Um, another one that I'm super excited by is, um, the scroll driven anim animations that are in CSS now. Mm -hmm. So the property is called scroll timeline, and then you can either choose the, um, I'm trying to think S there's two values. There's a scroll value and a view value. So the scroll value is looking at scrolling through the entire page, mm -hmm. whereas the view, it's a function too, because you can add parameters and stuff into it. But you have the view one, which is it, the view is a pretty much super similar to an intersection observer. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at when it's within just the viewport. And so you can have an animation that you set up. So you create your animation in CSS, you know, keyframes, whatever you want. And then you're saying it's, when it's in the viewport and you can define the offsets of how far off it is. And it's, as you scroll through, it does that animation without any JavaScript required. That I've already started playing around with. I've put some stuff out there and it's because it's only supported in Chrome right now, but if it's not supported, the other users, it doesn't break anything. They just don't have the animation. And mm -hmm. usually things like that, like if it's an image that slides in as you scroll down or fades in, the image is just there. So you're not breaking the experience. You're just enhancing the experience for people. So those are cool. Um, I'm really excited by that because it's, it's, you know, something that feels like it should be in CSS because it's all about the animation and, and making the visuals happen. And it was kind of annoying that we had to use JavaScript for it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if GSAP's happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, GSAP, you can do a bit more than you can with this, but that's, I'm excited for that. Um, there's anchor positioning coming, which I know people are going to like, 
Um, so anchor positioning is if you've ever had like a tool tip mm -hmm. and say you, you have your tool tip and when you hover over or whatever, that little tool tip appears, mm -hmm. but then if they're close to the top of the page, you don't want it to shoot out the top. You want it to yeah. come out the bottom. Yeah. Um, so, uh, is that what anchor positioning is going to do? I might be mixing it up with something else, but that is something that's coming where you'll be sort of context aware of what side of the screen it's on. If it's top bottom to make sure it's coming into the viewport and we don't yeah. have to worry because like the JavaScript stuff you had to do there was always a nightmare to try yeah. and uh, understand if it is, there's no room for it to show yeah, up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was one of those things you're just constantly reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else there's, there's so many exciting things. There's the parent selector now with has, um, yep. that was really awesome. And the cool thing with that and has makes me think a little bit of, um, the, the variables, um, just because it's one of those things where when they first got added to CSS, it's like, oh, this is just a regular variable. It works like everything else or a custom property. I should say it works just like a variable would, or, uh, you know, that I've been doing in my preprocessor like SAS or something. And then wait, because it's a live variable that the browser is interpreting and not something that's pre done, we can do a little bit more with this than we could with the normal ones. And that was the same with the has where has opens up doors where you're like, oh, I can select the parent because we have descendant selectors. You can say, if the parent has this, then I can use a descendant selector and select the siblings from there. So it becomes sort of conditional based on if one thing is present, I can style other things differently. Mm -hmm. Or you can even use it as a preceding sibling selector, which is something that we always, the parent selector was already seen as this is probably impossible. But then now we can say like, we could, and we could always select the, the siblings after something, but now we can say the sibling directly before that, or all the siblings directly before that. And that's kind of cool um, that we can sort of these new doors that are opening up um, with, with the stuff that we have now. Uh, and I'm sure there's other things that I'm forgetting as well. I could go on all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as you're going on, I just realized how far, I, how far behind I am in my <laughs> CSS knowledge with all these new things. The only things I knew about was the container queries and the has property because the container queries is, is such a cool concept of just applying media queries to a container rather than the viewport. It just makes sense. It needed to be there, I think. And also the has property. It's just such a hassle that you can't just select the parent based on the child. So it's, um, and there's, uh, I don't know if there was any solution to it, but I remember reading uh, CSS Tricks articles about it and that it needs to exist. So those are the only two that I know. Um, but uh, the layers was interesting. The animation, the CSS-based animations, I think it's pretty cool if um, you don't have to use the, in the intersection observer to apply animations based on scroll or a third-party library like GSAP or Framer Motion, which I use more in React because it's more React way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that's very cool that it's now, it will be native to CSS. Um, now, I think mainly... Uh, the reason why I'm probably falling behind on my CSS knowledge is because I've switched to using Tailwind. And when you're using Tailwind, you're not really thinking about the underlying what's happening there. It's just this the utility class that you can use and it just does a job and you just have to learn how to use them. Now, I've always thought about this question of can you learn CSS by just learning Tailwind? And because the way that I learned is I learned CSS first. So I know what Tailwind utility classes are doing. So I can just use them. I can search for what I want. But I wonder if somebody doesn't know CSS, they don't know what to search for, like to find a utility class in Tailwind. So uh, what is your take on Tailwind? I haven't seen anything you have done on your channel on Tailwind because um, it's becoming popular mm -hmm. uh, in the front end. So what's your take on Tailwind? And uh, if somebody wants to learn, um, how would you go about learning this stuff? Yeah. So I do get a lot of requests for Tailwind content. Uh, and my usual reply is I, I know why people like it, but it's not for me. Um, just because, I mean, I enjoy writing CSS. So it's, you know, uh, and, and I think it's it, to a certain extent, not completely, but it's a way to, you know, offload a little bit of the side, you know, that side of things. Um, not, not a hundred percent because it is just another way to author CSS. Uh, but that is also why I suggest people learn CSS first before getting into Tailwind, uh, a little bit like you said, because then you're not looking of how do I 
do this with this thing? Because then you're sort of looking for two different things. Like, how do I solve that? And then how do I solve it with Tailwind rather than just looking up how do I solve this? Uh, and I see it a lot in my Discord community because it's a lot of beginners in there that are coming in and asking questions. And you get people that are coming in with Tailwind questions and they're their code is a mess, which is fine because they're learning and it's new. And just the same mistakes they're making are the same mistakes that beginners would make whether or not they're using Tailwind. But it for <laughs> just because of the nature of Tailwind, when you're trying to debug things, I find it really, really hard um, because the inline nature of it. And then I'm in my dev tools. And for again, I'm not a, I, I've played with Tailwind, I've used it, and I understand enough CSS just looking at it. Like it's pretty. I can figure out what's going on relatively quickly. Um, the other reason that I do suggest starting with CSS is because I think Tailwind's completely useless unless you're using some sort of JavaScript framework. Uh, you need to have components. If you don't have components, you can't use Tailwind, or you shouldn't be using Tailwind, in my opinion. Um, just because if you you know you want to style every something on your page. It's a lot easier just to make a selector and our class and use that class over and over again on the different elements um, rather than, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think of like a really stupid example. But if I had a whole bunch, you know, I have an article and all of the paragraphs need certain styling on it, um, I don't want to have to put it on every paragraph. And I know that's an exaggeration to a certain extent, but I've seen people do that. And it's just, that's not the problem that Tailwind is trying to solve. Tailwind's meant to be working in a world where we have components to the same way that when you use a class, you don't have to rewrite that CSS over again. It's the same with Tailwind. You put in your Tailwind classes on it, and then you're never doing it again. Or if you do need to change it, you change it in that one spot. Um, so, And I think early on, you shouldn't be learning. You know, You probably shouldn't be in React if you're just learning CSS, I think. At least that's how I see it. Just because I think you're there's too many you're trying to learn too many things at once at that point. Um, and I'm guessing you know it's the same way I would say learn JavaScript before you learn React. I don't think you need to be the biggest expert and have mastered it because you never master anything. Because <laughs> um, people always ask me that too. When I've been you know when am I ready to start learning JavaScript or when am I ready to start with Tailwind? Well you know don't don't feel like you need to be. 100% proficient because you're never going to feel like that because you're always going to be learning something else. So when you're feeling comfortable with it, you sort of understand how it's working. You're going to be able to pick up Tailwind. You'll be able to use it a lot better and a lot faster than if you were trying to learn it uh, CSS through Tailwind. At least that's my own opinion. But I also, yeah. I'm a bit selfish. You know, <laughs> go watch my content because I don't, <laughs> teach, yeah, that's how I teach it. So <laughs> now I agree with you um, uh, primarily because that's how I learned it, but also thinking. It, the other way around, if I didn't know CSS, because sometimes uh, I don't know what utility class Telvin is using, but I know what to search for because I know the CSS behind right. it. So it's very easy to me to for me to find. And I I do think you when I was taking your courses or your approach to CSS is also different ways you can make it more efficient, whether it's using. Uh, classes or using utility classes. I, I remember vividly that you have had examples of using mm -hmm. utility classes. So instead of having a specific class name, why don't we just create utility classes? And Tailwind is just built on that uh, kind of concept of having these utility classes that you can just slap on your on your uh, elements and they just apply some CSS behind the scene. But I couldn't, uh, sorry, I couldn't agree more with you that this is very useful in where you're using frameworks where you have kind of con componentized your application into like small individual things that you slap all the CSS, all the JavaScript into it, and then you can reuse that rather than having to repeat yourself um, on, on every element that you're using there. Uh, so forgot what, uh, I had a question there about Telvin that you mentioned. I forgot um, what it was there. I, th this was I'm it. trying I, to think of the different points I made, but I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I like the, the comparison you draw with JavaScript versus React as a framework, because there are some people out there who maybe say, just, just learn React. As a tool, yes, you can use React if you don't know JavaScript, but you just kind of memorize how you're supposed to be doing it rather than understanding what you're doing. It's just like learning to, I don't know, use 
Photoshop. You don't know what's going behind the scene, but you, you know to click these buttons or do this sequence of things and it, you just accomplish. So you can do React without knowing JavaScript, sure, but you would never understand what you're doing. You would never be able to problem solve or create something that, that just doesn't hasn't happened before. It's the same thing with Tailwind. You can, you can learn how to style without knowing CSS, but um, it will be hard if you want to accomplish or, or create something unique. If you get a design from your uh, designer, a Figma file, and you're trying to understand how to do this or something that you haven't done before, I can't imagine approaching that without knowing CSS. Sometimes knowing CSS, it's just hard to wrap my head around how I'm going to do this. It's just, I don't know. <laughs> let alone not knowing CSS, I'm like, okay, this is just impossible. How would I know what utility classes to use? So I think uh, the approach is there. And, and as you mentioned, it doesn't need you to be the master at JavaScript to go to React or CSS to go to Tailwind. It's just knowing enough, being comfortable enough to understand what's going on and being able to search for what you need to kind of figure out. And then you can add these tools as something that kind of layers on top of your knowledge. Um, absolutely there. Okay. Yeah, I made that mistake early on because I learned jQuery before I learned JavaScript. Um, and then it was the, and it, you know, that jQuery was JavaScript at, at one point. Not not really, but that was with every, like any project used jQuery for a long time. And so it was like, well, it's easier. Why not just use that? And then as that started to sort of fade away, then I'm going, you're sort of trying to break down in your head, like what was jQuery and what was JavaScript of what I was writing and trying to work backwards. And you pick up from there because, you know, one of the reasons we started jQuery's declined is just because they've made things easier to do in the native language. And, but it, it really was this thing of like, okay, I don't know which part was jQuery, which part was JavaScript and just trying to understand that and break things down. And, and it made for a bit of an awkward transition at one point. And I think it's the same thing. If you learn React first, then you get thrown into something else. Well, what do I know is which pieces that I was using were React and which pieces was I using were just native JavaScript and like where it, it can be really difficult there. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's interesting your throwback to jQuery. I actually learned some JavaScript and jQuery techniques, not jQuery, but yeah, I, I mentions of jQuery in your videos. So, so mm -hmm. um, definitely the intersection observer and animations in, uh, in CSS, which always required the JavaScript. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'd be very interested to see Tailwind content from you, not as a replacement of what you're doing, but just like any other thing that you have covered, I would definitely like to uh, have your take on it um, because it is... Uh, it's it's a it's a bit of a selfish thing to say because I I'm just doing more telling these days, but um, I think uh, it'd be great to see how you approach it, how you do things there, because uh, your way of doing stuff has been always uh, eye opening and and uh, educational for me. So maybe if you create content on tell, I'd be like, oh, I was using it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is I, how I should. Do. I, with the <laughs> amount of experience I have with it, I would probably use it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. So, um, what's uh, what are you up to now? I I, uh, I I would like to know. We would include links to your resources, your courses, and stuff. But what are you working on right now in terms of courses or videos or anything that's uh, like a passion, exciting project for you? Yeah. So I'm trying on YouTube front. I'm just continuing to to plug along. And one thing I'm trying to do is balance the whole new feature stuff that are coming out with just sort of more fundamental things or things that you could use today. Cause it's very, especially I've been doing this for seven years. So it's easy to get caught up in like, oh, these are the new things that are coming. Um, so I'm trying to find a balance there overall. And that's just where people can find most of my stuff. Um, I'm very close to finishing my course beyond CSS, um, which is goes beyond CSS, obviously, as the name implies, it's not for P it's my advanced course. Um, that's sort of, okay, you're comfortable with CSS now. Let's go into the next steps. Um, I do use SAS in it just because I still use SAS personally. Uh, I know that it's declined in usage a lot, but I sort of don't use it for the things that are getting added to the native CSS. Um, it's more for some of the extra things, actually generating utility classes and doing some other stuff like that. Um, and then it gets into Astro and, and the CMS as well. 
Uh, and then I have, I've started doing speaking now as well. So I'm going to be at CSS day in Amsterdam in June, which I'm super excited and scared about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I'm also going to be doing smashing conference in New York in October. Nice. And, oh, and the last thing, um, I just got, I'm doing a workshop with front end masters in November. Beautiful. As well. Yeah. That's, I think that's everything. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great, man. It's, uh, uh, it'd be great to see you in these conferences. I know I asked you about the React Conf and whether or not you're going to be there, um, but I've never been to the CSS specific conferences there. I've, I've always seen um, the great speakers there and it's, it's uh, awesome to see you there also presenting you. Yeah. Um, it's intimidating for me because it's all the people that I've learned everything from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, uh, I think you're well deserved it with the amount of um, the content and education you've put out there throughout these years. Thank you. So, yeah. So this was uh, great. I, I want to take this time to uh, really appreciate you for the influence you had on my journey personally, breaking into tech uh, back in the days learning whatever that I have learned from you, from the fundamentals of any site, the structure, the HTML, the CSS, the design, a bit of a JavaScript to make it pleasant. So thank you for your contribution to my journey and any anybody else in my audience or anyone who, you know, dabbled into web dev probably have come across your content. So I want to acknowledge you for that and thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that a lot. Of course. So maybe in a second part two series following up next time, we would just um, allow you to share your screen and demo something more practical. That's that's your way of uh, saying, uh, you know, presenting stuff. Maybe we do this again in future to actually have some um, uh, feasible takeaways from new CSS that I'm not actually touching or covering on my channel. As the final piece, anything you wanted to say? Uh, I know people can find you on your YouTube. You don't need my promotion. We're going to include links in the description to your courses and to your socials, but any last word from you? No, I think I'm good. I just want to say thank you so much. It was a a very nice conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, Yeah, thanks. Same here. Thank you very much.